If you walked further over this way, down there, I don't know if you can see it, I, I'm uh, in J.C. Park, you can't see that, you have to go way, way up the other end, uh -huh. and it, there's a whole complex there. Oh. If I could roll across, because it's only a mile away. Co-president, and our other co-president, Katrina Bruceball, is way sitting over there, so you can talk to either one of us anytime. Welcome to this meeting. It should be a very exciting one. We have many guests. What I'd like to do before we start with the speaker is to go around the different tables and just, if you have a guest, introduce them. If you came by yourself without having a guest or somebody, just stand up and tell me who you are. So start over here. Oh, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> that was a quick cool wow. Uh, I'm a guest, actually, Nora Donato Hitchcock, and I'm with the Department of Human Services, the Neighborhood Accountability Board, and the Restitution Accountability Board. I'm Tom Clark. I'm also on the Neighborhood Accountability Board. I'm the chairman of the Libertarian Party here in Lee County, on the board of the ACLU, and a few more hats also. Okay, way in the back. Hi, I'm Jeff George, and I'm running for Congress this year in the 14th District as an independent. And today we're just here to uh, observe, and uh, we're broadcasting live online to let everyone know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anybody else at that table? Way in the back. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Commissioner Tammy Hall, but I'm not really a guest, I'm a member. And so on Saturdays, <laughs> Saturdays we're usually very busy, so I don't always get to come to the luncheons, but I do get to a lot of the other events that are in the evenings and things. But uh, I'm, I'm happy I could make it today. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful view. Uh, Bob Shemani, the County School Board. I'm just uh, very pleased to be here, and this is a fine group, and uh, I'm looking forward to the uh, activities. Thank you. You gotta join us. <laughs> yes, I got the application. I do have it. Thank you. Okay, this camera right over here. Um, this is oh. Thank you. Good afternoon, Miguel Fernandez. I'm a local attorney in private practice here in downtown Fort Myers. I've previously run for judicial office, but uh, I'm pleased to be here and uh, can't wait to hear the uh, discussion. He's going to sign up too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, way in the back in the corner. Hello. Hi, Mike Hoffman. I'm the chairman of the Neighborhood Accountability Board. I'm Lieutenant Layton. I'm with the Lee County Sheriff's Department, representing the Sheriff Mike Scott. I'm here to listen to all your great views. Ray Judah, just a local public servant. <laughs> 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 okay, right over on the right over here. Um, good morning. My name is Gwen Middlebrooks, a retired teacher, and I'm here with my husband, Jim Middlebrooks, who's running for Lee County School Board District 2. Jim Stack. <laughs> 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 I'm Jim Pelstrey. I'm an attorney in the town. I'm not running for anything. I'm not elected to anything, but I am interested in what's going on. Cool. I'm Randy Henderson, and uh, welcome to the host uh, city for this event. Thank you for having me in the city of Fort Myers. I am a city councilman for the city of Fort Myers, and uh, Miguel, nice to see you again. And um, I am likely to be candidate for mayor of this fine city one day. And like Tammy, uh, I am a, a newly installed member of this organization because Carol was persistent enough to keep that application in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Not because I had reservations about joining, it's just because I have to have in front of me as a constant reminder to get the check in the mail. <laughs> and as far as I know, the check has been sent. So I hope so. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Okay, Katrina's table. Any guests there? Um, uh, I'm Bobby Gassett Morning. Mike is a friend of mine and a friend of my fiance's, and uh, he's actually interested in politics with me, so I dragged him along and made a home. I'm not as illustrious as you asked. I'm uh, David Plaza, so with the News Press Editorial Board. Okay, this front table right over here. Hi, I'm uh, Pat Washington. I'm a faculty at Florida Gulf Coast University in the Department of Social Work. And Lynn's been tapping me on the head for the last several months, and I finally made it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Lynn Hall. I'm the 
Lynn is terribly persistent because <laughs> um, I'm the speaker today. My name is Candace Moore, and um, I'm the director of mental health for the jail, but I've done many, many other things. So here I am today. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, Ray Mason, and I'm uh, Candace's husband. <laughs> okay, I welcome all of you here. Thank you very much for coming. I'll have some announcements after our speaker, but we want to get to our speaker because if we, again, we, everybody is excited to hear what she has to say. Lynn Munson, our lead member, will introduce the speaker. Lynn? Excuse me. Thank you. Well, I will say about the best laid plans of mice and man. And we had this very carefully orchestrated that every table would have X number of people and therefore we, we would know exactly where to place our guests. That didn't work out that way, but I hope we're all enjoying each other. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted just to uh, review briefly where the league has been uh, in terms of presenting to the community the problems of children at risk and the cost of not caring. Uh, I think that we have statistics now over at the Jack Center uh, showing us that today we have 2,818 young people, 16 and under, who have been through that center. When we began our exploration of this subject in 1900 and, uh, uh, 2004, um, there were only about 700. So that's quite a difference, about four times, I think, the number of young people who have been now through the assessment center. But uh, we still try. This is our last program, and that is the reason we try, uh, We wanted to have all of the community here, because this is not a league thing. It is a problem that faces the community, and we want as many community people here as possible. And we're very fortunate today. We think we have 17 and 18 people from our community. When we made our first uh, uh, presentation to the community, we had 166 people, thanks to the generosity of Walgreen, and I want to acknowledge Walgreen again today for being the host for our guests. Uh, it, we always need friends and Walgreen has certainly been a friend to the league. I'm not going to uh, talk to you very much without Candace. I am passing around a sheet that you can sit, uh, look at, take home with, uh, because I don't want to spend any more time. We've taken a lot of time so far. I just want to tell you how fortunate we are to have this woman in the community. She has been here for in everybody's house that needed her for the last 15 years. She's, she's the person that is available to be helpful. She was the director of um, uh, Ruth Cooper, and now she has an overwhelming job, an overwhelming job. She is the director of the Department of Mental Health in the county, as well as overseeing those patients that are assigned to the county. So let, let's present. Candice Moore. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, good morning. I, you know, the, the subject we're dealing with today, it's, it's a serious one. And I know that Lynn threw out some numbers that are kind of alarming. But, you know, it's Lynn and I are optimists. We know that these things can happen. You know, we know the sky can open up, and you know, celestial voices will be singing. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, but as a community, we're not helpless. Our hands are not tied. There are options we have that are easy for us to do once we figure out where we're going with it. You know, when you're trying to solve a problem, first you identify the problem. What is it? And then you start fleshing out, okay, where do we go with it? So my presentation, and uh, 
I, I hope it'll, uh, I can keep everybody awake here. Um, and it's going to be in four sections. And one is the background, how I came to realize what I realized about what a solution would be. There's a section on what we know. There are certain things that we already know, so we don't have to totally reinvent the wheel. We also know what doesn't work, tried it, didn't work. And, um, and a proposal that uh, Lynn and I, it's funny, for two women who just met each other out of just circumstance, how many things we've come to the same conclusion. It's programs that she has worked on in the past. It's, as I see it, where we need to go, where we can easily go to solve, solve the problem of stopping the kids before they turn into criminals and bigger problems. Um, back around that 2003 time was when the um, money stopped from, uh, they took most of it out of intervention and put it into correction, which was, it's wise to anticipate the need for growing correction. The sad thing is we needed both and. We need to catch it on one end so we can try to eliminate it on the other end. Um, currently, right now, um, I've done many, many things in the community. It's been um, an incredible journey for me. But one of the uh, positions I have right now is I am the director of mental health for Lee County Jail. I've been there about three years. I work very marginally. We have some juveniles who are being um, charged as adults, but most of the people I work with are the, the high risk usually male um, uh, offenders. And they've been a wealth of information, um, you know, looking at, you know, how did this happen? I, I don't know a parent yet who's given birth to a child and holds this newborn and said, God, I hope you grow up to be in prison someday. It didn't start there. You know, the guys didn't end up where they are today. Um, one of the sidelines my husband and I, um, my husband and I do, he's an addictionologist, I'm mental health, but if together you have a pretty neat package, <laughs> is we work with returning offenders, guys who've been in prison, who are coming back out and trying to figure out society. It changed a whole lot from when they went in and they didn't do it very well, you know, before they did go in. And two of the main areas that were made a difference. And this is something that I, I hope to reiterate all around. There were two basic things that happened. One was a very dysfunctional family with nobody to really show them another or a better way to have a life. And two was a very good family, but often it had, um, generally was, was run by the uh, female head of household, their mother, their grandmother, who was working a couple of jobs. They lived in neighborhoods that were very seductive. Do you want to be the kid whose mom is out there, takes you to Sunday school, you know, works two jobs, you're still poor, or this other kid, and they're starving at 12, 13, 14 years old, is walking around with a grand in cash in his pocket because he's stealing. And he's dealing drugs. It's easy. And the kids, the huge struggle of right and wrong happens very, very early. And most of the guys who eventually fell started very, very early. Um, the way I got to the conclusion that I'd like to share with you all today is, um, you know, basically it started out 27 years ago when I ran a home-based daycare. This is before I turned professional. I was just a mother. I was somebody who happened to like kids. I had four of my own. I don't know what I was thinking, but they are tax deductible. <laughs> um, <laughs> but at the time, it was an era. Um, it was a blue-collar community over in North Lauderdale on the other coast. Um, I was one of the few stay-at-home moms. And of course, you need to, everybody needs to make a living. And so I opened a daycare, a home-based daycare. And what I found coming out of the woodwork were latchkey kids. And if you kind of understand the community that we have there, 
people were working hard and they didn't make a lot of money and everybody knows your baby's got to go to daycare. But somewhere around the age of right around eight, nine, it was like, look, the finances are tight, something's got to go. And so it's like, okay, we'll just stay at home and lock the door, don't let anybody in. And uh, the kids learned early on that they were pretty much on their own from the time school got out until their parents got home. Um, most of these kids started congregating at my house. And um, hey, as long as you did your homework, cleaned up after yourself, and learned how to take care of some of those babies I had running around, I had eight-year-olds all through the neighborhood who could change a diaper, burp a newborn, make fix a bottle of formula. They had some good basic skills. But they wanted to be somewhere. Two minutes of my time was better than no time from any grown-up at all. They were good kids. And a lot of them had, um, there were a lot of distractions out there. Some of the kids fell away and, and followed the kids who were getting in trouble because one, in some respects, it looked like they were having more fun. But two, again, when it comes to drug abuse, when it comes to drug dealing, probably the number one issue here, and, and even, even on the arrestees, I'd say close to 90% of them are either users or dealers or have something to do with drugs in their crimes. So we need to, we need to stop some of the um, influence, the very seductive influence on our kids by giving them somewhere to go. Um, you know, there were many other things I've done since I've been here in Fort Myers. Um, I worked with Ruth Cooper for a number of years. I started out doing therapeutic foster care and saw, you know, some of the anguish the kids have. It's a hard thing being a kid. And when you go through being taken away from your families, you know, maybe your family's not the best family, they're kind of dysfunctional, it doesn't work right, but throwing the baby out with the bathwater is sometimes got to, you know, it's not a first line approach. It's just for the, the worst case scenarios. And it's a heartbreaking, difficult job for anybody who's got to try to do it, figure out which kid needs to be diverted this way. You know, the ultimate goal is to save them all, to give them all something, a hope, something worth living for, something to grow up into. Um, I found that to be hard. It's a real burnout kind of thing to work with kids who have, who feel that hopeless. Um, it, it's something that makes you realize that it is a time of great decisions. Um, so I, I eventually ended up, there was the um, multi-systemic family therapy program through Ruth Cooper, and this was a DJJ funded intervention program. Um, it took kids from the ages of 12 to right about 15, um, and we'd go in, we'd work very closely with their families. It was an evidence-based practice. It was proven worldwide. Um, we did have some moderate success with it, and we also had the only unit worldwide under one supervisor with all the clinicians actually practicing the discipline the way it was written, the way it was supposed to be. Um, but one of the things we did have success is, I, I don't want to put down any kind of intervention that's being used. Everything that works a little, it matters, it counts, it's good. But to get the most bang for your buck, we really need to start looking down smaller. How can we fine tune what we can do, what's available to us? Um, real early on, when we were doing this program, we realized 12 is too late. 12 is too late. 12 is when you're getting close to middle school. Um, the family patterns have already been established. Um, bad habits have been established. And your window of opportunity is, is all but missed. We found that if, you know, the 
elementary school teachers, they could tell you right away which kids were going to have a problem, which kids were having problems. By the time you get to middle school, I'm sorry, you got hormones, you got changing classes, you've got all sorts of influences in our in our county. You're not necessarily near your community neighborhood school, depending on which school you choose or which program or availability. You might be on places outside of your neighborhood. So the sense of continuity, the sense of community, is sometimes a real struggle for these kids, and it is too late. You need to catch them when they're very young, before the habits are bad, while they're still open, and while they still have this shining sense of possibility. Um, let's see, okay. I'm, you know, I've, I've worked at the jail, I've seen some of the kids I've worked with that came through that sometimes make me wonder if I'm such a great therapist, how come they got arrested? But again, just to, some of these kids we are going to lose. And to, to go back and deconstruct it and find out, you know, again, what happened. Um, when we talk to the guys, most of the kids have juvenile records. Of the juveniles who are in the jail right now, most of them have rap sheets that are ridiculously long and often started 10, 11, 12 years of age. Again, window of opportunity right there. Um, when, we, when we talk to the kids that had the unsafe neighborhoods, you know, a, a lot of it was the criminals are, are in the sight of the child. You know, maybe we go by, we drive by, we're not necessarily looking, we're not seeing, but it's their neighborhood, it's their street. And they see what's going on. And a lot of these, um, you know, a little more experienced criminals, you know, what's a good way to get some product moved and not get in too much trouble because hey, it's a little bitty kid, what are you gonna do, you know? So they target these kids. They come and look for these kids. And if they have no one else to talk to, the kids, the kids fall into it. They fall into a sense of, I belong. I'm a part of something. A number of them, we have met some felons, just amazing people that you look at and say, my God, under other circumstances, what you could have been. There is wisdom. There is beauty. There is just you know, amazing ability to process. There's just great, great things in some of these people who have just come out after having done 10, 15 years. But some of them were, my family was poor. I had to help, I had to help my family. I had to, you know, some of them it's like, well, woohoo, yes, I would like uh, one of those, one of those, and uh, wrap it up with a big bow. They, some of them was in for themselves to get cool stuff. But a lot of it was to offset the poverty for their family, their extended family. At least that's how it started. It gets carried away. Um, too much money in your pocket can sometimes turn into a, a pretty dangerous thing. Um, the other thing that we found was lack of, of, of role models, especially strong male role models. Most of these kids are raised by their moms, which is not a bad thing. It's like, even though it seems like mom always gets the bad rap. But as uh, one of my sons told me when he was only four, he's like, Mom, you can teach me how to be a good person, but you can't teach me how to be a good man. And there was a distinction that, you know, even at four, he kind of picked up on. Um, and, and a lot of these kids, most of these kids, came out and said, there was really nobody I could look up to, a man who is strong. Those strong women is probably what kept them from being um, in some of the problems that they could have gotten into. Okay, so what do we know? There's certain basic things when you think about a solution, again, and, and Lynn and I were so clear on this yesterday, this only yesterday, so clear on this. It's not an impossible task. This is so totally doable to rescue some of these kids, to get them out of the system. That'll reduce taxes. That'll increase your safety. 
that will make you be able to walk down your neighborhood and not worry um, every time somebody who looks a little uh, shady comes up to you. Because right about now, if you live in some areas around here, you know, you'd best be looking over your shoulder. It's, it's not safe. So what do we know? Here's what we know. We know that most parents love their children. It seems like a no-brainer. But most parents do want what's good for their kids. They don't always know what to do. And they don't always welcome the support that's available around them. But they do love their children. And if they could find a way to do it, they would like to have what's best for them. Families are one of our, one of our natural resources. What else do we know? We know that if a child gets to be 10 years of age and has a good self-image, and that doesn't necessarily mean is a good student, is um, you know, the most beautiful, whatever, but feels good about themselves, is a happy, giggly, normal kid and feels okay. Life is okay. Their optimism is still there. The innocence is still there. These children have a tendency to not become felons, to generally not even commit that many misdemeanors, though all kids have the capacity to do something really dopey, you know, driving on the suspended, not paying their tickets and stuff like that, but not looking at the kind of criminals who are out there over and over and over again with increasingly violent and dangerous crimes. What do we know? We know that, um, Counseling with children, it's helpful on some level, but kids don't have the power. You can build up that, that sense of wonder and, and openness for a child, but unless you have the parents on board somehow, it doesn't really work as, as well as it could simply because the parents have the power, but again, any intervention is better than none. Just having the child there and being able to work with the child is better than not working at all, but not as good as finding out how to get the uh, families involved. What do we know? We know that most parents, when their kids are starting to be stressed, um, counseling is, is prohibitive. Cost just bumps them right out. If they do have Medicaid, for instance, which provides an awful lot of um, services to kids, you got to think in terms of what this really means. I mean, these are well-meaning people. I, I supervise many wonderful counselors who are out there working with the kids. But what is the goal of Medicaid? The goal of Medicaid is to show that you are broken. We have to make sure that you're sick enough or you're not getting well fast enough so we can justify a few more hours. They don't believe in maintenance or, or you know, uh, the, the concept of um, preemptive wellness. It's, it's not in the budget. It's not their philosophy. And there is that tendency to try to look for broken things instead of encouraging the things that are, that are positive and strong. It's just built into the system. It's not, it's not the counselor's fault, it's not the family's fault, probably not even Medicaid's fault. It's just simply, this is what it is because this is the expectation we have of the people that we send out there. What do we know? We know that most adolescent crimes are committed between the time when school gets out and when their parents get home, between three and seven. This is burglaries, criminal mischief, experimenting with um, drugs and alcohol, making babies, all of the uh, things that kids can find to fill up the empty hours. This is the prime time for criminal activity. Um, when I was doing that DJJ program, the MST program, one of our focuses was, okay, supervision. How are we going to get somebody keeping an eye on this kid during that time frame. And it had to be, sometimes it got really <coughs> creative because there comes a point when it's really hard to keep an eye on them. And again, 
when they're when they stop being very small, our tendency is to stop monitoring, and it's it's not that's not really the best way. 